So that means that it used to be going faster. <laughs> How many can figure this out now with no help? Okay. Well, now, if the earth is only 6,000 years old, this is no problem. It was going a little faster when Adam was here. He wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch anyway, as far as we know. But some of these guys want me to believe the earth is billions of years old. Man, if you go back billions of years, the world was spinning real fast. <laughs> Your days and nights would be pretty quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. <laughs> you never get nothing done. <clears throat> the centrifugal force would have been enormous. The winds would have been 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And you think dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago? Oh, I know what happened to them. <laughs> they got blown off. No, they did not live 200 million years ago. The Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same way. This creates a problem. The hot air blows off the desert and kills the trees next door, and that area becomes desert. The process is called desertification. Well, now, they've done quite a bit of study on Sahara that's pretty obvious it is growing. There's just no question about that. But they said, after studying it for years, they said, you know, the Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. Okay. I I have no reason to doubt that, but I do have a question. If the Sahara is only 4,000 years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Why would the biggest desert on earth be less than 4,000 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood, mm, right? So the desert couldn't start growing until the flood water went down. So I predict, based on the Bible, the biggest desert in the world will be less than 4,400 years old. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. Maybe the Bible's right. Did you know when they drill into the ground, sometimes they hit oil? The oil's oftentimes under incredible pressure, like 20,000 pounds per square inch. It'll come squirting up out of the ground, poof, like a big zit. 20,000 PSI. <laughs> Well, the guys who study this problem say, you know, the, the oil has some pressure simply because of the rocks on top of it. It's called the overlying weight of the rock, the overburden. That produces pressure. But the oil pressure is greater than the weight of overbearing rock. So this should have cracked the rock and equalized the pressure in less than 10,000 years. Okay, well, if all that's true, then I have a question. Why do we still have oil pressure? Actually, where did the oil come from? Well, most scientists agree, and I agree with them, that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure into oil. Clear back in 1970, they learned, 71, they learned how to make oil in 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes in the laboratory. In 1996, they set up a factory in Australia to turn sewage sludge into oil in 30 minutes. They opened up a factory in Texas a couple years ago, can turn almost anything to oil. They're taking turkey guts and turning it into oil with heat and pressure. Check it out, Discover Magazine, May of 2003. Sinclair Gas Company has the dinosaur as their logo. They say dinosaurs turn to oil. Yes, boys and girls, these dinosaurs, dinosaurs mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. I have a theory about the oil. Here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. In that flood, lots of critters and people drowned. And they got covered up by the gravel and the rocks and the mud and the sand, and it got pretty heavy after a while, and it squished them <laughs> into oil. So the oil's down there today from the people and animals that drowned in that flood. Which means, if you stop and think about that, you drove over here today on some of your ancestors. <laughs> Next time you're pumping them in there, you can say, Bye, Grandpa. You, sh <laughs> you should have listened to Noah. <laughs> he told you it was going to rain. You should have got on that boat. Hmm? Yeah. I was preaching in Denver, Colorado one time, and some guys came to the meeting, and they said, uh, Hoven, uh, can we talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. After the meeting, we talked, and they said, now look, you know, we know that you go around teaching the earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, we'd like to prove you're wrong. Would you come with us, please? I said, sure. These guys worked at the National Ice Core Laboratory just outside of Denver. They said, we go to, the Green to Greenland and to the South Pole, and we drill holes through the ice. Government job, you know. Uh, and we save the center part of the hole. Oh, we need more ice, that's for sure. We're running out of ice. Go spend a billion dollars, go to Greenland and get some. Uh, well, they drill these holes down in the ice. They take what's called a core sample. Here's a picture of the coring machine. This thing drills down and snaps off a six to ten foot section of ice and pulls it up out of the hole. 
and they said, we want to show you these ice cores, Mr. Hovind. Come on in the freezer. They took me in this massive freezer they've got there, about as big as this auditorium, 36 below zero in there. And they took these ice cores out of their styrofoam tubes and laid one on the table and said, now see this ice core here? I said, yep. They said, you see the rings on there? It looks like tree rings, dark and light and dark and light. I said, oh yeah, they're very clear. Interesting. They said, now Hovind, in the summer, it, the snow melts just a little bit on top, and then it refreezes and makes clear ice, which shows up dark here on the picture. In the winter, it packs the snow, and it makes white ice. So what we have here are examples of summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, just like annual rings of a tree. I said, okay. They said, now the deepest hole we ever drilled is 10,000 feet. And we counted 135,000 annual rings. And here you are claiming the earth is 6,000 years old. Hoven, you're wrong. I said, now, fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? See, apparently they didn't know about the lost squadron, but some airplanes ran out of gas during World War II and landed in Greenland. How many have ever heard of the lost squadron? It's been on TV a couple times. Go to thelostsquadron.com and see all about it. Well, a rich man from Kentucky got a brilliant idea to go over there and get those airplanes off the ice. Brand new World War II airplanes sitting there on the ice. He said, hey, let's brush off the snow, gas them up, and fly them home. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. They had to find them using ground-penetrating radar because the airplanes were under 263 feet of ice in 48 years. They melted a hole down to get to one of them, a P-38, and took it apart and brought all the pieces up through the hole. They call it cold mining with a hot tube they ran water through called the gopher. They melted a hole down there, took the airplane apart, brought the pieces up through the hole, and put it back together in Middleboro, Kentucky. It flew a couple years ago for the first time in nearly 50 years. Now, when they melted down to get to the airplane, they went through ice rings. Interesting. Airplanes were in the ground for 48 years. They were 263 feet down. Those are historical scientific facts, okay? That's five and a half feet a year worth of ice accumulating on top of those planes. You had 10,000 feet as the deepest hole they ever drilled. You divide that by five and a half and you get 1,800 years, not 135,000. Now, deeper layers get squished, I understand. The pressure changes it to fern, F-I-R-N. I understand that. I taught her science for years. So really, 4,400 is no problem. 4,400 years is no problem to account for all the ice at the North and South Pole. Well, I went up and visited the airport where they're putting this thing together. I got to talk to the guy who helped dig it out. His name is Bob Carden. There's his picture and his phone number right there. Call him if you don't believe me. I said, Bob, when you melted down to get to that airplane, did you go through ice rings? He said, oh, yes, many hundreds of them. I said, how could there be hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be like maybe, you know, 48? He said, annual rings? He said, those aren't annual rings. He said, that doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week around here, can't you? Yeah. But here's a Scientific American article where the guy is still calling them annual layers. Now, folks, either he's confused or he's, he's, he's under-informed of the topic or he's deliberately lying. He may just be ignorant, okay? I hope that's the case because ignorance can be fixed. Stupid is forever, but <laughs> ignorance can be fixed, all right? That's the difference, by the way. The guy that works with the Eskimos sent me this postcard and said, Brother Hovind, uh, I work with the Eskimos in Alaska. He said, they've got over 40 words for snow up here, different types of snow. He said, I got 18 or 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 layers of snow. Those layers are not different ages, not a year apart. Same thing with the textbook when they tell the kids about the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? We cover much more on that on video four. The geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist any place on planet Earth except in the textbooks. Get our video number four for more on that. Those layers are not different ages. All over the world, petrified trees have been found standing up, connecting these layers. Now, they're telling us these layers are different ages, and yet we've got petrified trees connecting them. I'm sorry, you're mistaken. The layers are not different ages. They all formed in one flood, and it doesn't take long for things to petrify. They can, things can petrify quickly. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. I've got a petrified pickle in my museum in Pensacola. The lid to the jar rusted off and the pickle turned to stone inside the jar. We got the jar and the pickle. Come on up and see it. One kid sent me a bag of petrified acorns with a little note. He said, Brother Hovind, I put these acorns in the water to hope they would sprout, and I forgot about them. Ten years old, you know. Next spring, my mom found the bucket on the back porch. 
and said, son, get rid of these acorns. He said, in less than a year, they turned to stone. I've got them in the museum. Stop and see our dinosaur adventure land in Pensacola, Florida. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It doesn't take millions of years to give birth, praise God. Okay? <laughs> There's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. It's on the table now. There's an article about it. It's called The Limestone Cowboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, we cover more on that on videotape number six about petrification. Uh, the Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. 80,000 tons of mud comes down the Mississippi and dumps off in New Orleans. That delta is growing larger and larger and larger. There's no question there's a lot of mud